Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today we're getting enthusiastic about analysing conversation. But first, thank you for spending another year with us travelling around the sun. It's been so much fun doing this again for a third year, and thank you for sending in all of your examples and quotes and fun facts uh, for our anniversary. Uh, and we've also been enjoying so much seeing your photos of the socks and the glottal bottles and the liquids for your liquids and the other Lingthusiasm merch uh, in your lives. We're looking forward to bringing you another year of Lingthusiasm, both our main episodes and our bonus episodes in 2020. Our current bonus episode is about onomatopoeia. And you can get access to the Onomatopoeia bonus and 33 other bonus episodes at patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. So when we talk about kids learning language, we often get really excited about a baby's first word. But before kids can even get to that first word, let alone first sentence stage, they're already doing something that's really cool linguistically, and that's having conversations. I'm already having great conversations with a kid who doesn't have any words yet, and that's because she can participate in that back and forth and taking turns, and I make a noise, and then she responds, and then I, as a good supportive parent structuring her through her language acquisition, will, you know, respond as though she's given some kind of me. I'll be like, oh, oh, really? I love it when grown-ups are like, ah, that's interesting at kids, uh, because they're kind of <laughs> motivating them through this, uh, learning this skill of having conversations. Yeah, I love it. I mean, suddenly all my friends are having babies now, so uh, I've been getting to practice this kind of pseudo-conversational skill uh, with a lot of different uh, small kids. And you also see like fun videos of this on the internet. There's these two twins in a kitchen that seem to be having this sort of nonsense conversation back and forth with each other. Um, there's one with like a dad who's having this conversation with his kid, uh, and he's like responding to the kid as if it's a real conversation. Uh, and the kids are learning something from that. Those videos get me every time. I love it so much. And one thing they're doing is using uh, intonation, which is that way of changing the tone and the melody of your voice. Uh, Nicole Holiday talked about that in our episode 13 on intonation. And we do other things to show people that we want to speak or that it's their turn to speak um, and how we build conversations like this. And there's a whole field dedicated to studying this from the perspective of linguistics. Yeah, conversation analysis is such an interesting subfield of linguistics because a lot of us think about the sounds or the, the words or the sentences, but there's also this like broader conversational level where there are also interesting patterns going on. And a thing that I found most satisfying about encountering conversation analysis was how understanding how there are sort of different cultural conversational norms, which helped me navigate different kinds of conversations that I was having and different kinds of norms that other people were having, even if you're all speakers ostensibly of English, even if you're speaking the same language, you can have slightly different conversational norms depending on your personality type or uh, what region you're from or various other factors. Understanding those more explicitly can help make those conversations more rewarding. Conversation analysis has definitely helped me through uh, holiday season, family conversations, uh, interacting with small kids, uh, job interviews, uh, all of these places where back and forths and conversations happen, um, understanding them from kind of what's happening on the linguistic level is a, it's a really useful way to think about conversation. Yeah. And, you know, travel when you're interacting with people from different backgrounds and stuff like that also really helps with that. So there's this great metaphor that gets used with conversation, which is already kind of present in English in general that conversation analysis have really seized on, which is the idea that conversations have a floor. And when you have the floor, you're the one who's talking. So I have the floor right now. But I could interject and I could take the floor and... The metaphor is from places like parliaments, where there is a literal speaking area on the floor where a person comes to and does the speaking. And in formal contexts, there are formal ways to officially take the floor, so to speak. Uh, if you've been in high school debating, you'll know that the person has to kind of walk to the middle of the room or stand up. Uh, if you have been to parliament, you'll see where they physically walk to on the floor to speak. 
And even in less formal contexts, like when you start going to school and you get taught, and you, like you need to raise your hand before you talk. That's a way of saying we've got thirty people in here, and the only way to manage the floor is to do some more sort of more formalized things because by default the teacher has the floor. Or you know, in some contexts, you have something like a talking stick that you can pass around, and that also helps signal who has the floor. And those formal ways of showing who has the floor are great in formal situations or in large groups of people where lots of people might be kind of competing to be the one to speak or, or negotiating who's going to be the one to speak. But when there's a smaller groups of people, we can also signal our interest in taking the floor. We can do that with our voice by kind of going, ah, uh, yeah, or, or, or kind of saying, oh, that's, that's a great point, and then waiting for them to speak and then stepping in. Or we can use the way we look at someone or we can lean forward or, or use a gesture that we kind of hold in space to show that we are ready to take the floor if someone will give it over to us. I've been talking at a lot of conferences on panels recently, and the interesting thing about being on a panel of four or five people is that you're kind of figuring out how to navigate who has the floor because you're trying to present a good experience for the audience and let each of the panelists talk about their area of expertise. And you want to kind of negotiate that who has something to say next sort of thing. So I've become very attuned to what I call the like, I have something to say about that body language gesture combination, which is like you have one hand that's kind of raised a little bit, you know, just below the level of your face with like maybe your index finger extended and the other fingers kind of curled. Uh, and then your your eyebrows a little bit lifted and your mouth kind of half open, and you might say something like, ah. Um, and of course, I'm doing it, but you can't see it, but you can kind of just picture that, like, hello, I would like to interject politely, please, gesture set uh, and facial expressions. And that's one way of signaling, like, I'd like to talk in a sort of semi-formal context. And in those contexts, a really good panel moderator or a really good, like, chair of a meeting will read that and kind of go, okay, we'll hear from this person and then that person as a way of managing that. In more informal situations, it really is a matter of everyone in the conversation trying to be as receptive as possible to the needs of each of the speakers. Or sometimes, you know, deliberately not doing that and saying, like, I know you have a thing to say, but I, let me finish this. Uh, you know, you, there's, you can not let people have the floor as well. I think the really interesting thing about conversation analysis is it shows just how much negotiating we do. We might be talking about, you know, a topic over here, but so much of our energy about talking around that topic happens around the edge of who has the right to speak, who's going to finish their turn, uh, who's going to talk next. And there are lots of ways to not give the floor over to someone. So we talked a bit about, you know, the I'm, I'm willing to speak now, body language and, and things you can say. But there are also strategies to stop people from taking their turn. So continuing to speak. You can use intonation to stop people taking over uh, the conversation by making your voice go up a little bit at the end so that it makes it clear that you still have something more to say and then people will be less likely to interject. See, look, I didn't interject at any point there because I was like, Lauren clearly has something to say because she's going up at the end uh, and she doesn't want me to interrupt her. Thank you very much yeah. for taking the floor maintaining cue that I was using. And even things like a filled pause. So when you say something like, um, or, uh, or, you know, well, uh, I think maybe that can be a way of saying, I'm still searching for the words that I want to try to get out, but I have words to get out. It's not just a, a silent pause where, uh, the other person might take it on their turn to talk. Also holding your gesture up in the gesture space. So if you go up and make a gesture and you don't put it down, even if you don't say anything. And I like to use this when I teach language and gesture. I kind of see how long the students can cope with me having my hands up without saying something before they start <laughs> looking a bit uncomfortable. And you can stretch it out really far. So if you have a conversational situation where you don't want to give someone else the chance to speak for a particular reason, there are lots of strategies that you can use to maintain uh, being the person who's doing the talking. One that I found really interesting is the use of eye gaze in this, because if you think of a kind of simple notion of eye gaze, you might assume like, oh, but people are talking to each other, they must be looking at each other. Mm -hmm. But in actual fact, what often happens is that the person who's listening is more likely to gaze at the person who's talking, but the person who's talking is more likely to gaze away. And then the talker can use that return of the eye gaze to the listener or to the groups of listeners to signal that they're finished with their turn. And listeners can also do things to support the person who is talking. So you can nod your head, you can go, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, you can kind of give them some vocal feedback, um, but that gaze is also really important. 
Um, and it's why people find it really stressful if they're the one talking, if people are looking at their phones, uh, because it indicates that they're not respecting that this person's talking at this point. Right. And we should say that there are different sorts of gaze norms. You know, not everybody is comfortable, you know, maintaining eye contact. And, you know, that can sometimes result in in conflict if people have different sets of, uh, you know, whether they're expecting somebody to be holding their gaze as, as if they're listening, or whether you can say, actually, I'm doodling, and that makes it easier for me to listen, but it's not necessarily part of the same set of norms. I'm also a very vocal supporter of people who have the floor. So I will do lots of smiling and nodding and humming, and uh, that's not the case for everyone. So it's also a matter of, you know, different audiences, whether that be because of cultural differences or just personal preference differences, um, respond differently. I try to be that person when I'm in a larger audience of like that person who's just going to nod if it, at the speaker, especially if they seem maybe they're like a little bit nervous. Uh, or I know it's the first time giving a talk or something. And I'm just like, I'm just going to sit here nodding uh, because it's always really reassuring to look out in the audience and see someone there like nodding every time you make a point. Because that's how we've learned to structure a conversation. And then suddenly you have a different genre, which is a formal talk, and you're not getting those cues that you're used to from conversation. It can be really confronting. And it's really confronting when you have someone who sits there and doesn't really smile or nod. Uh, and then at the end, they're like, that talk was – and they, they were clearly engaged. And you're like, oh, I – I have a very conflicting set of cues from you right now. <laughs> I was giving a talk a number of years ago and I had a uh you know person sitting in the back row at some point just like put their head on their palm and like face down like kind of face palmed during the talk. Oh my goodness. And I was like, "Oh no, what if I just said?" And you know, like it turned out it was fine. <laughs> but it definitely freaked me out. Just a long day of talks from this poor person. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I think is really interesting when it comes to conversation is how people structure the amount of silence or the amount of overlap that happens in between conversational turns, like how you structure that passing back and forth of the floor to one another. So we've talked about different strategies people can use to keep the floor, to hand it to someone, to be the supportive listener who's letting them keep the floor or to take it, but they happen at different paces and in different ways in different conversations. Have you ever been in a conversation where you felt like you either had a hard time getting the floor because the other person was just talking so much you couldn't get a word in edgewise, or you were stuck with the floor because the other person just wouldn't talk at all and you're carrying both ends of the conversation? I've definitely been involved in conversations with you where I'm pretty sure other people would have a difficult time getting a word in if they weren't particularly assertive about it because we're both... <laughs> very good at talking and and kind of as soon as you give over the floor i'm happy to take it we often overlap um we owe a great debt of gratitude to our producer claire who makes this sound like a conversation people can listen to sometimes <laughs> um, but i definitely know that i i have a habit of being very in a conversation and as soon as someone hands me the floor i'll take it and i'll hand it back just as quickly and if they're not in there i'll probably have something else to say yeah, and for me, if I if I'm excited about what someone's saying, I want to be sort of anticipating what they're going to say and not finishing their sentences in a like you know trying to cut them off sort of way, but in a like I'm showing that I'm following you so closely that I can anticipate what you want to say because of how much I'm paying attention right now. There's a part of me that always kind of wants to be the kind of wise, <laughs> you know, wait for someone to talk and then you know take a moment's breath and come back with an incredibly, like, pithy reply that is very efficient. But actually, no, I actually find uh, the cut and thrust of a, a fast-paced, enthusiastic conversation much more satisfying. I think of, like, the owl character from, like, Winnie the Pooh of, like, ah, oh, yes, that's very interesting. Let me retreat to my cave and ponder it for a week, and uh, and then I'll come back to you with a reply. But I have been in the situation where, even though normally I'm I'm really keen on the the cut and thrust of the conversation, I'm definitely more of that sort of uh, on that sort of side. Sometimes I have been in conversations, especially if I'm a little bit tired, where someone else will just be talking, and I'll be like, uh, uh, "Yeah, I guess I could say something, but I'm just silent right now, and you're just you're just doing all the talking, and I'm I'm sorry about that, but like that's <laughs> that's what you're doing." When I'm in Nepal, that is definitely more the pace of conversation, and I think it's partly just that. It takes having a conversation in a second language to slow me down a little bit. But I think also conversation styles in general with the people I talk to tend to be a bit more, I'll say my thing, and then you'll say your thing, and then I'll say my thing, 
and it's a it's a different pace of conversation. I will say that so I grew up in Eastern Canada in Nova Scotia, mm-hmm. and I have been very used to having these high overlap conversations. And then I moved to Ontario for undergrad, and this was the first time that I ever heard people saying the phrase "No, you go ahead." <laughs> In conversation, and I was like, "What? Why? Why would? Why would anyone ever say this? Because clearly, the thing that people do is just like you both just keep trying, and then eventually, either you give up because you didn't actually think your thing was that important, or you eventually get it get it out. And nobody takes any offense about this because that's just how conversations happen. Why would you ever tell someone, "No, you go ahead." You could just be talking at that point. Why would you be spending this time on conversation management phrases? Uh, but now I go back to Nova Scotia, and I'm like, wow, people talk really fast. So in different contexts, you have people who are very involved in the conversation and kind of get right in there. And then as a kind of spectrum of individual preferences or larger cultural preferences, at the other end, you have people that are very considerate of the other person's right to be the person who has the floor and is taking their turn. Yeah, and this was why it was really satisfying for me to read Deborah Tannen, because she has several books which have been very popular pop linguistic books about conversation. Um, and one of the distinctions that Deborah Tannen makes is between high involvement conversational styles and high considerateness conversational styles. And when I read this, it was like, oh, here's this thing that I've been doing that I've noticed in different types of conversation where you have some kinds of conversation where you have this sort of cut and thrust and this back and forth and this high level of overlap. And I think it's probably not a coincidence, uh, Lauren, that we became friends because we both have this type of conversational mm. style, so we don't feel like we're interrupting each other. <laughs> I've noticed that I tend to be friends with more people who have high involvement. I'm sorry I consider it as people. I'm sure you're all lovely, but it just doesn't always click as much. <laughs> And I think, yeah, I think there's something about someone who you click with is in some way a factor of how you interact. Yeah. And like, I noticed that I tend to be friends with other people who also talk quickly <laughs> uh, or other people who also have this sort of this high level of involvement in conversation. But the thing that I like about the distinction that Tana makes here is that involvement and considerateness both sound really positive. They both sound like really nice things to be. It's not like the fast talkers and the slow talkers, which sounds kind of pejorative for both groups, to be honest. Mm. Uh, both traits that are really positive as long as you understand that's what's going on. I think it's worth remembering not only are these traits uh, scale and that as an individual you can move up and down them depending on who you're talking to and the context that you're in, but also – uh, and we talked about this a little bit in our episode uh, 23 about uh, nothing and how silence can be meaningful in conversation. And the differences that we're talking about here are like millisecond differences. Yeah. But we're so sensitively attuned to when we can take the floor or when someone else wants to interject that These differences are are really small, and there's not a lot of difference between individuals, but overall, we're very sensitive to it. Yeah, they're so tiny. The example that Deborah Tannen has is she recorded some of her friends at a Thanksgiving dinner, um, and some of them were New Yorkers and some of them were Californians. And she found that the New Yorkers were more high involvement and the Californians were more high considerateness. And that's within even the same country. You know, you have two different coasts with two different uh, sets of norms. Uh, and, you know, you could, you can build out that continuum even more. You know, I've said I've noticed it in Canada. There's, you know, you could, if you think of it in terms of particular countries or particular nationalities, um, something like maybe Italians or Spanish speakers are going to be more high involvement, whereas something like, I think, Finns was Deborah Tennant's example in Finland. They're very high considerateness. They have a lot of silences mm-hmm. between statements. But even that, it's still milliseconds. And we learn these things really early. I am raising what is probably going to be a relatively high involvement child because (laughs) I'm teaching her the type of turn taking that I find acceptable. Yeah. The thing that I also found really interesting about uh, Tenen's research is that she also gives you a sort of set of tips for what to do if you find yourself in a conversation with someone who is at a different point than you from the scale. This is a delightful applied use of conversation analysis. It's so useful. I tell this to people at parties because A, I'm that kind of person, and B, it is really like one of the most like, here's how linguistics can make your life better examples that I have ever encountered. I think this is why people like her book so much. 
So as a high involvement person, if I'm going to have a conversation with someone who has a really high considerateness threshold, um, what should I do? Right. So as a high involvement person, something you may encounter uh, more often is that you're in a conversation with somebody and the other person is just not talking. And you're like, oh my God, I did not sign up to give a monologue here. Why is this person not keeping up their end of the conversation? Mm -hmm. Are they bored? Are they unengaged with me? Like, I have to do it all the work myself. Yeah. And so the temptation when that happens is to kind of go into monologue mode of like, I guess I'm just doing all this work myself. I didn't sign up for this, but I guess I'm just giving a monologue now because like this person just won't talk. And so Tannen points out like the temptation is to kind of dig in deeper into the thing you're already doing. But what's actually probably happening is that this person is waiting for a pause that's long enough that they can interject and they don't feel like they've gotten one yet. This is why I find sometimes having coffee as like an actual activity is quite useful because even the most high involvement person has to stop for a few milliseconds to have a drink. Sometimes I do this very explicitly if I'm like having lunch or something with someone and I notice that I've been doing a lot of talking and so their food is like almost all eaten and my food is not eaten. And I'll be like, I'm going to eat my food now. You should talk to me. (laughs) That should be a quantitative analysis, counting how much food is left for each person at different points in the conversation. It's like, I still have three quarters of a sandwich here, and you have barely any sandwich left, so it's your turn to do the talking, and I'm going to eat my sandwich now. (laughs) And it's great, because, like, A, I get a sandwich, and B, I also don't have to do the whole side of the conversation, and the other person doesn't feel like I'm monopolizing the conversation as much. So what if I'm a high considerateness person, or I'm in a conversation where I, I feel like that's my interactional style, and I'm being bombarded by a high involvement person? Yeah. So even though I would consider myself fairly high involvement, sometimes I've been in the flip side of that, where you have somebody who's doing all the talking and not letting you get a word in edgewise. And the temptation, if you're more on the considerateness end in a given conversation, is to kind of say, okay, well, I guess I'm just not going to get a word in edgewise. I'm going to just sit back here because this person seems totally content to just like do all the talking. I'm just going to give up. And like how just doing all the talking yourself if you're on that end is also a kind of digging yourself in deeper rather than trying a different strategy. Mm -hmm. The person who seems to be giving a monologue actually really wants to be interrupted or what for you will feel like interrupting. Yeah. Uh, I had a friend that I knew a number of years ago who was part of a larger friend group. And this person was kind of known in our friend group for like being a person that would kind of was prone to monologue or kind of get into conversations monologue. And because I'm like pretty high involvement, I was often able to sort of like interrupt this person and then other people could kind of get in after me. And like we had this meta conversation among our friends was like, you know, do you guys mind that I, you know, keep trying to like interrupt this person's monologue? And other people were like, no, 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 this is great. Because once you've interrupted her, then I can get in. Not because she didn't want to be interrupted, just that you were the person who could do that. Like, I just had enough tolerance for overlap that I was willing to do something that to the rest of this group, and this was early on when I had moved to Ontario, so this is when I was an undergrad, um, and I was still used to this really high involvement style, and most of the people around me also had this high considerateness style, except for someone else who also wasn't from the same area, uh, who also had this really high involvement style. So I was able to kind of, like, get in this person's very high involvement style, and then all of these considerateness people were like, oh yeah, okay, now I can talk, because there's been a long enough gap that I feel like I can get a word in edgewise. So it's really tempting to kind of like keep doing the strategy that you're most comfortable with. But in fact, it can be useful to do the thing that seems rude to you, whether that's it seems really rude to leave silences, or it seems really rude to interrupt. That can sometimes help break a conversation out of its sort of fail state where one person is doing all the talking and the other person isn't talking at all. So thinking about cues to like give over the floor or to take the floor and then using those to do the thing that probably feels like the thing you don't want to be doing can make it a bit easier. Yeah. And it was, you know, reading this on paper, and this is why I tell people like, hey, there's research about this, because it feels really rude to do the thing that, you know, doesn't come naturally. Like, it feels rude to me to leave too many silences, because then it's like I'm not interested. But if I know that the other person is waiting for silences, or if I know the other person is waiting for interruptions, even though an interruption might feel rude, it can be cooperative in the right set of circumstances. It kind of gives you permission to help make the conversation better. And of course, remember, you have other linguistic tools in your conversational toolkit for doing this. And so taking a moment to ask someone questions if you feel like you need to give them a chance to take the floor can be one way of very actively handing the floor over to someone. A question is a big like, 
here is the floor and I am handing it to you strategy. This was something that I also found really interesting about Tannen's research, because she talks about how some conversational styles, and I'm not sure if it completely correlates with the high involvement versus high considerateness thing, but she talks about how some conversational styles use questions, and other conversational styles use one person's anecdote as kind of a springboard for me to give my version of that anecdote. And the other person uses that as a springboard for their anecdote, and then I use it as a springboard for my anecdote, and you kind of go back and forth with, you've shared something, so that's my cue to share something, even without questions. Whereas for me in a conversational style, I actually find questions fairly rude. <laughs> because it's assuming that I have the right to ask you about a part of your life that you may not feel like you want to share with me. Yeah, exactly. Like not the how are you question. Like that's fine. But if someone's like, you know, <laughs> what do you think about this? I may or like, may not be willing to disclose that information. <laughs> that's confidential. My name, you're not allowed to have it. <laughs> I guess I'm the same. I won't ask people directly if they have kids, but I might say a story about my little kid and then that's an invitation to them to talk about if they have kids or not, if they want. Yeah, exactly. Like, I'm not going to ask someone point blank, like, do you have kids? Or if they mention a dog, I might be like, oh, your dog, you know, how how old is your dog or something like that. But I'm not going to say, like, do you have any pets? Like, that just feels weird to me. But in the inverse, it can also feel weird if you're used to a conversational side that does have direct questions. If someone's just doing what Tannen calls this mutual paired disclosure, so you tell a story, I tell a related story, you tell a story, I tell a related story, um, if someone's just doing that style and you're waiting to be asked a direct question, you can be like, wow, this person's only talking about their life. Don't they care about mine? So I've had to get used to saying, well, if someone mm. asks me a direct question, at least I can assume that they won't consider it rude for me to ask them the same question back, which is about where I'm at. I'm not <laughs> still not really starting with questions, but at least I'll, I'll reciprocate questions. And hopefully people don't find that that rude. But you're doing some in conversation, real time conversation analysis to figure out how best to proceed with the conversation. Absolutely. That is exactly what I'm doing. Because linguists gonna ling, you can't take the linguist out of the conversation. Have you done any like official conversation analysis, Lauren, speaking of direct questions? I've done a lot of recording conversations and looking at how people use language in them, but it's worth saying that conversation analysis is a really specific approach and the, the detail in the transcription is meticulous compared to, say, the transcripts that we create for the show. When we create a transcript for the show, we've already had Claire do wonderful audio editing and we've already really structured the conversation to be as clear as possible. She takes out all of the ums and ahs and a lot of those pauses and a lot of those overlaps that make it hard for people to listen. And then when Sarah does our transcripts, she cleans it up even more. And we do this because we're not trying to do conversation analysis on the transcripts. We just want something that people can have a pleasant experience reading. And so that's very different to a conversation analysis transcript where you're recording every single pause, you're really making clear where those overlaps are, all of the false starts, all of the laughter. This all indicates kind of how people are building the flow of conversation. And it can be really weird to look at a transcript of a conversation because you're used to hearing a conversation or directly experiencing a conversation in its natural environment. And then seeing that written down, especially with all of the annotations, it doesn't look like a play script. Or it doesn't look like a conversation in a novel because we don't actually talk the way people talk in novels or in plays. We do have these overlaps and we do have these sort of starting to say one thing and then ending up somewhere else and, you know, misspeaking a little bit and then repairing it. And we don't even notice it when we're having it in real time. And then you see it on a page and you're like, what is this mess? <laughs> and in some ways, we can only really do this level of conversation analysis. And it's not surprising it only really started in the you know 70s, 80s, 90s as it's built up with affordable audio recording and now video recording. Oh, that's true. Because conversation analysis requires this like revisiting and transcribing and more detail and more detail. And conversation is so fleeting and it's so hard to bring people back to it and even accurately recall conversation. We do a lot of editing in our head. And so I don't think it's surprising that conversation analysis is really closely tied with the evolution of technology. Yeah, which also makes it interesting to think about conversation in the computer context, because of course you also have chat as a format. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I found really interesting when I was researching my book, which perhaps you've heard of, we've been talking about a lot of those uh, other episodes of this podcast. Um, one of the things that I was interested in looking at when I was researching Because Internet was how the 
chat format had evolved, because some of the very earliest formats of chat actually transmitted people's messages character by character, like letter by letter, space by space, punctuation mark by punctuation mark. So you could see it in kind of excruciating detail as someone was typing. And then it seems like it would be a technological regression to say, actually, we're just going to send it like message at a, t at a time rather than every single letter. But it turns out this seems to be better for controlling the floor and taking turns in between stages of conversation because it's not quite as real time, but it is more like, you know, a dialogue that a conversation actually happens in. I hadn't ever really thought of that before, but it would be very distracting to me to compose a message if I saw your message being composed at the same time. It's like, do you remember those like old school PowerPoint animations where they drop in like one letter at a time in the title and it would just be mm. really painful to watch? Yeah. I think that's what real time, you know, chat would be like if it was character by character. But this technology has existed since the 70s. Like there are conversations in the 70s that are character by character. And now we don't do it anymore. And you also get platforms, so like Google Docs, where if you're collaborating on the document itself, you see other people's messages character by character. But if you want to chat about what's in the document, you go back to a turn-based thing where you either use the comments or you use the chat sidebar, or sometimes people will just like each go on a new line and they'll talk that way. But you have to do stuff to make the turns more evident, which again, seems like it should be regression until you think about conversation as a thing that's not just composed of like individual sounds or individual signs, but actually of turns. So whether it's a conversation with someone who still doesn't even have words or a conversation across a great distance using computer chat, I really love that in many ways conversation really is a central feature of language and a central feature of something we should be analysing when it comes to language because we talk about language being a really human thing. But I think in, in many ways conversation is what makes language a fun and delightful human thing. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA and syntax tree, scarves, ties, and socks, and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter. My blog is allthingslinguistic.com. And my book about internet language is called Because Internet. To listen to bonus episodes and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Recent bonus topics include onomatopoeia, reading fiction as a linguist, and a behind-the-scenes look at the writing of Because Internet. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay, too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our audio producer is Claire Gorn, our editorial producer is Sarah Doppiarella, and our editorial manager is Emily Greff. Our music is Ancient Cities by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! <laughs>